And we continue now with uh, Marco Barabale, um, who is a research fellow at UR for the University of Venice. Um, and he is um, um, basic co-founder of Saladox. Member of the collective. A member yeah. of the collective of Saladox, which is the um, salt storage here in Venice and also Euro area. Uh, it used to be a salt storage and now it is the platform for the uh, political, uh, artistic, uh, experimentation, uh, activism, and also uh, theater. Uh, and Marco himself, he has uh, these skills, capacities, and talents, and craftsmanship working in these areas. Of this Adaptation. Area. Adaptation. Yeah. So, please join me in welcoming Marco Barabaggio. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me here, and I think I have to begin with a communist invitation and a communist apologize. The invitation is about uh, a demonstration that will happen in Venice next Sunday. I know that the program here ends on Saturday, but maybe some of you will, be, will still be here in Venice, because Saladox is also part of the Committee Against Big Cruise Ships uh, of Venice, which we discussed a bit two months ago when you came at Sale with the with the previous workshop and we're going to stage a huge demonstration on, on Sunday with our small boats at the Canale della Giudecca, so just in front of the Giudecca island, trying to disturb the passage of big cruise ships uh, in Venice. Uh, so this is the invitation. The apologize is because I do have a paper, a long one too, so sorry about it. I cut a few parts, I know it's late and I know I disobeyed your suggestion not to have a paper. But I want to make some point as precise as possible, so I, I think I still need, a, I still need a, uh, a paper. The paper is structured in three parts. The first part is a bit more, let's say, theoretical, meaning that it will try to frame uh, some ideas about the relationship between communism and art. The second part is more related to the presentation of a few cases from contemporary art history, from the late 60s and the 70s about uh, neoliberal and non-neoliberal or communist models of uh, uh, art labor. And the third one is about uh, alter institutionalism, which is one idea in the present about a possible strategy for communism in the art field. Uh, I think I will stick to the first two parts and see if there, there is time, otherwise we, I think there is enough, there is enough material to uh, to discuss. So, uh, I have to situate all to the, also the, the issue of communism. To me, to the collective of Saladox, to the social movements, cultural social movement I've been engaged with during the years, communism in art meant basically to experiment non-neoliberal models of art production, circulation of cultural and art labor, let's say. And experimenting also meant to fight and to struggle to reclaim uh, the enclosures that a uh, neoliberal system uh, poses on, on, on the art field and on art as an activity, art as, a, as an institution. So I think uh, a little bit of contextualization is needed, of course, even from my very partial perspective of, a, uh, of someone living in Italy, so uh, a European but I think that uh, I, I title probably uh, uh, too ambitiously my paper um, Art and Communism in the Time of Reactionary Populism. So I, I think it's really a too ambitious task. But in a way it helps me to, and I think it's helped us to contextualize what's the, what's the situation now for those who are interested in our common in processes. Uh, if we focus on Europe or if we focus on, on Northern Africa, only I think we must see that the repression is on the rise. I think if we take, for example, a uh, place like Turkey, that in 2011 was the, 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 the country of Gezi Park that we all were very fond of, now what we see is that intellectuals, artists are marginalized and are uh, in prison. Or if we, I recently had the chance to work with some artists from Egypt, 
And the situation there is that an authoritarian regime is still dealing more and more severely with a, radic with a wave of radicalization that also interested many artists, may, may, many media activists, many art workers during the 2011 revolution in Egypt. We have all the reactionary forces that are gaining uh, positions uh, in the heart of Europe. But at the same time, this, uh, let's say, this, this victories of reactionary forces should not, um, uh, it's not something that uh, can, let's say, uh, we don't have to forget the fact that the reactionary forces uh, does not exact, does not exhaust, sorry, the neoliberal function of the institution of art as a governmental tool. I think there are two regimes here that are working at the same time. So sometimes there is censorship, there is repression, there is jail for artists, there is a sort of suspending of freedom of expression, but at the same time, art under neoliberal conditions still works as a governmental tool. So, still works mostly through capturing common contents, radical contents, and through valorizing them within the market of contemporary art. So, in a way, uh, this governmentality of the contemporary system is a, is a trait that still remains here. And as many thinkers taught us, uh, governmentality means that there is a, the power has to be seen as an action over some other action. To govern something, you have to leave people some degree of freedom. And it's on this degree of freedom that the market valor valorization works. Without, without freedom, without freedom, you don't have governance, if you read Foucault, but you have dominion. Uh, you have like a rigid transcendental authority. So even in times of, uh, of reactionary forces gaining power, I think it's even more and more uh, important for us to break with this dispositive of capture that uh, neoliberal art uh, uses on, 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 on the drives uh, towards communism or towards art communism. And I think there are, the, the first part, which is theoretical, I, uh, I don't see it as something that doesn't have any relation with reality. Pascal Guilain yesterday told us about the, important of, the importance of ideology. I see theory, and I'm interested in theory when it poses very, very urgent political questions. So I would like to focus first on two theoretical perspectives through which it is possible to uh, address the issue of communism and, and, and art. Not the only one, but probably the one that were most important for my, uh, I don't know, for my, for in, in my life so far. So, the first, uh, we could think of communism in relation to art in terms of praxis. This is the first uh, point of view. Praxis meaning giving priority to the issue of labor and of artistic labor in our specific case and to the issue of the subjects of this labor. So, artists, curators, uh, or more in general, art, 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 and cultural, art and cultural workers. And here we find ourselves in the field of the so-called politics of the sub subject, still on the shoulders of giants such as Marx and, and Hegel. The second possible perspective, and I must say that these two perspectives are not doomed to walk on separate paths. I think the most uh, prolific political results come when these two perspectives, in a way, meet and melt. Uh, the second possible perspective is the one generated by the so-called philosophy of the event. Brendan was mentioning about the event of sound, about the importance of looking at sound not as something produced by a subject, but as something that happens as event. And so there is a sort of funny connection here. Um, and I'm thinking here especially of a North work by, by Maurizio Lazzarato titled The Politics of Event, where, where he underlined the role of Deleuze and Gattari in shifting the analysis from praxis and its subject exactly to event. What does it mean? It means that the work is not to be explained through subjects that produce it, through the, through the activity of labor, 
but through series of events that create new possibles. And here I'm using possible as a noun to create new, uh, to create new possibles. These possibles are designed through what the lesson category called assemblages of enunciation. And these assemblages of enunciation give these possibilities an existence in language, in sign, in gestures. Then the second level from the enunciation is that it's possible way to be effectuated or realized in dispositives, in institution or in other social constructs. What, and the important thing that I would like to underline is that what is at stake here in the shift from the philosophy of the subject to that of the event is that with the latter, so with the philosophy of the event, you avoid, this is the important thing, you avoid binarisms that typically affect politics. So politics looked at from the perspective of the, of the event is not male versus female, workers versus capitalists, artists versus activists, hand versus table, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, so in front of this rigid subjective alternatives, the event is what opens up the field of possibles. And politics is seen exactly as the, this activity, not of realizing uh, teleological pro projects, but of realizing the opening of new possibles, of new possibilities. Um, we refer to Deleuze and Gattari. Lazzarato speaks about Leibniz, speak, speaks about the sociologist Gabriel Tart. But just to mention a more recent thinker uh, with which we, should, we, we probably are more familiar because she's very popular in the art field, let's think of uh, Donna Haraway. Let's think of her last book. Uh, let's just uh, analyze the title. Uh, staying with the trouble, making keen and towards the Toulousine or something like that. I don't remember it exactly. But where her idea of staying with the trouble, so her idea to stick to reality, her idea to look in the face the reactionary era in which we're living, uh, passes through the idea of making kin as a generative process, process of multi-species events. Making kin means to make relationships, to build strong political relationships uh, among beings, human, organic, non-organic stones, uh, pigeons, uh, jellyfishes, women, men. And this idea of making kin is exactly an engine for, an ev for events creation. And this event creation goes towards what she called the Toulousine as an alternative to the unsustainability of the Anthropocene. So, in a way, it's not important here to focus on Donna Haraway, uh, but, I mean, I think she really think, she really could be fit this genealogy of the thinkers of the event and not of subject. But, as I said before, I think the most interesting theoretical and political indications come when these two perspectives, the politics of the subject, the po politics of the event, come together. And I think tonight we will have the chance to meet Tony Negri here at 6.30, if I'm not wrong, and Tony was really one of the philosophers who, during his whole life, tried to put together the project of liberation inherent of, in, in, in Marxist prax, uh, praxis with the event. So with the generative power of the event, it must not, uh, since we're talking about communism, it must, not, it must not be forgotten that one of the chapters of his book Commonwealth is titled Biopolitics as Event. So the idea of putting together the project of liberation, a project of liberation, a certain narration, a certain uh, idea of a linear time, but also an idea of the event as a necessity to liberate, as a necessity to produce communism without the event that is a rupture in the linearity of time, you don't have revolution. This is basically what Tony Negri really in poor words uh, talks about. The idea that is not that you have a project, of a Marxist project, and in a very orthodox way, this project goes in a linear way from the present towards a brilliant and amazing communist future. There is no communism or no communism without the event, without the rapture, without what he calls kairos, without the idea of seeing 
uh, time as a not as a linear entity, but again as a as a uh, as a possible breaking of routine, as a possible breaking of the constituent order of the constituted order. What differentiates the notion of event expressed by Negri compared, for example, to the Agambinian one is that for Agamben, event means only rupture. Agamben is for the state of exception, and he says the only possibility that we have as communists, or probably as anarchists, he would say, is that, that, that punctual events break this violence of a permanent state of exception. What Tony points at is that events means rupture, but at the same time, event means uh, uh, bears a constituent power, bears in it the idea that we can make word, that we can transform the word, we can make words through event. It's not just that we can sort of balance the violence of a state of exception, and this is how the word goes. And I think this is something that really, really uh, interests me, and I think this is this idea, basically what I want to say, I'm not a philosopher, so forgive me if I'm, but I'm really trying to sort of highlight the fact that I think that produ productive thoughts or productive thinkings, again, come from the idea of breaking with binarism. And I think that the idea of looking at communism also in relation with art from both the point of view of praxis and event is a good idea. <laughs> that's, that, that's the point. So, to finally jump with both faith into art, I would suggest some hypotheses. And these are obviously, obviously these are traces, not, not solution. I see them as notes that could be useful if we want to put our hand on the idea of a commony of the art field. Um, and these come, these, these hypotheses come, as, as uh, Gediminas was pointing out, to from different fields of my activity. So for my from my academic research, which is by the way, way very precarious. So now I have a, a position next year I probably will not have any position inside the university. But also come from my uh, long term activism in the cultural field with this collective of, of Solidox. I didn't think of presenting the activity of Solidox because we already did it two months ago. So just wanted to talk about someone else not to get bored myself. So you will be much more bored, but um, it's more fun to me, so yeah, sort of. Um, so the first thought I would like to share is, is an obvious one. So that separating the subjects of, pra of praxis from the event can lead at best to good theory, to good sociology, but we, it will not break with the neoliberal governmental frame. A huge, let's think about the fact that a huge quantity of critical knowledge about art labor circulates within the art field. Uh, be it about how the work is, how, how labor is precarized, be it about some possible counter solution of common responses. But this knowledge is really, it's, it's really difficult for this body of knowledge to break with the neoliberal framework. It's very difficult to realize the common. It's very difficult to break with the, with the enclosures in which we, all of us, are in a way working for most of the time when we work within the Within the within the art field. Um, um, so on the other hand, we see other, I think, optimistic thing, other positive things. We see the contemporary art history. So I, I'm, I'm thinking of particular books already registered. What the persistent effects in terms of subjectivation on artists and cultural workers sparkled by revolutionary events such as Occupy Wall Street, such as the Egyptian Revolution of 2011, uh, such as the 1977 move movement in Italy, and even earlier, the global uprising of 1968. So why I'm, I'm, I'm uh, mentioning these uh, revolts? Because I think that it's really through the moment of the event that also artists and art people Permanently, permanently, permanently change their perception of what art is and what is their role within society. And this is definitely something that is much more difficult to happen 
within, just staying within the neoliberal framework of the art market, within uh, social art or within studying critical thinking. It is when the monotony, monotony of linear time and the authoritarian capitalist of financial telos is interrupted by a multitudinarian kairos that artists, like others, are able to question the neoliberal art framework, the mannerism of social art, the subjective obligation to embrace an art career as an entrepreneur of the self. The fact that their production could only be read through the mediation of the art market, and when I say art market, I also mean the academic market or that of large-scale exhibitions, festivals, and so on and so forth. So maybe revolutionary events are not victorious in the sense of a permanent change in the orders of societies, and what follows them is both repression and capitalistic innovation, um, two possible and not mutually exclusive answers, but they are life-changing moments uh, for many. There are moments in which traditional art roles, the artist, the curator, the critic, the performer, are substituted by what Gerhard Raunin calls the artistic singularity, where art is the opening and the effectuation of new possibles, so art as event, art is the opening and the effectuation of new possibles, and where this action of creation becomes common, involving art and non-art people, not only as art, but also against neoliberal logic and its attached subjectivation devices. Um, I would like to go now back to some examples in, in, in recent art history that, in my opinion, are interesting in, in discovering how a neoliberal model of art production became hegemonic. It's hegemonic even in the, in the present. But I would like also to say that I'm not looking at the past with any nostalgia. Um, if we embrace Kairos, if we embrace the time of the event, if we really embrace time as a possible moment of rapture, it also means that history must never be fetishized. Uh, golden ages never existed, and the tools that we see in the past must at least be updated, if we're interested in the present, are common. And I think that, again, it is exactly at the crossroad of praxis, of revolutionary event, and also uh, its capitalist answer, that we trace how the neoliberal version of, of our labor gained gain its hegemony and at the expenses of other deviations towards uh, common dimensions of creation. So what follows is a, is, is, is a brief summary uh, about how Harald Zeman was turned into a model for independent curated and for art, general, and for art labor in general, uh, even if, if it was not the only possible model. It was a model that gained a certain hegemony among others. So my thesis is that Zeman work in ethics perfectly embodied what capitalist innovation was looking for as an answer to 1968 mobilizations. The classic study of Boltanski and Chiappello, titled The New Spirit of Capitalism, suggested a certain linearity between the struggles of 1968, specifically those who gave priority to a request of autonomy over a request of social welfare, and what? And the development of capitalism towards post fordism and of management towards a less hierarchical and more participatory uh, methodology. Uh, what they are suggesting, and I don't think they are right, I think that, again, we are, we are here in front of, a, of an event, of, of, a, of a capturing device uh, developed uh, by capitalism to counteract the democratic and common instances by the movements of 1968. But the point is, Boltanski and Capello say, guys, 1968 wasn't that big thing that we think, because lots of movements were asking for more autonomy, but what happened instead was this uh, capitalist system basically uh, captured this instance of autonomy and used it as a way to develop its model of production and used it as an engine not for communism, not for liberation, but used it as an engine to pass from a stage of production uh, guided by hardcore industry, hardcore for this industry, to immaterial economy, to uh, post-Fordism, let's call it the way 
let's call it the way we want. I don't think, that's, I don't think they are right because there's no linearity. Uh, capitalist innovation is always an answer. It's not, it's not, I, I, I don't think they're right when they say, you guys, activists of 1968, students, artists, were fake because in the end you became, you became a sort of leaders of the new capitalism. You became, you had all your, all your positions in the French government because they're referring to the French, uh, the French situation. But for sure, this thing is true. The capturing of the autonomy is something that really happened and played the role in the development of the capitalistic machine. So, when in 1968, um, so Zeman was a pioneer not only as an Ausstellungsmacher, not only as a maker of exhibition, but I also think he was a pioneer uh, in being a prototype for the neoliberal art worker as we know it today. So when in 1968 he decided, Zeman decided to resign from the position of director of a sm small Swiss Kunsthalle, uh, his main goal was exactly to gain more autonomy from the institution. But this autonomy was to be developed as a purely entrepreneurial adventure. He built, this is very interesting, he built the narration of a one-man enterprise as a one-man pseudo-institution. We, we talk so much in, in the art field now about fictional institution. In 1968, uh, Seyman created his own, his own one-man fictional institution that he named Agency for Spiritual Guest Work. And despite the fact that Seyman himself was very soon perceived as a new kind of curator artist, treating the exhibition as an art piece, he himself preferred to compare his activity not to art, but to migrant labor. In fact, the Agency for Spiritual Guesswork was meant to be, in Zeman idea, was meant to be a sort of solidarity statement against racism towards migrant workers that was a growing phenomenon in Switzerland at the time. Um, and the fact that Zeman was perceived as, a, as an artist by other artists is in fact historically, uh, it's not something recent. It goes back at least to Documenta 5 in 1972 and the controversy between Daniel Buren and other artists and Zeman. Daniel Buren uh, accused Zeman of, we all know, of using the medium of, of exhibition as an art piece and using the art pieces as, a, as elements of a bigger art piece, X is exhibition. Uh, but it's very interesting that Zeman uh, presented himself not as an artist, but he compared himself to migrant worker in his fictional one-man institution. And even more, one of the favorite slogans of this fictional institution was from vision to nail. And that strikes me not because it alludes to an imaginative breaking with the division of labor, but because it sounds really autarkic. As a curator, I do everything on my own. I can do everything, from vision to nail. There is no collaboration. I am my own institution. I am, uh, in, in my person, the whole productive process is contained in my own persona. In a way, this is also, uh, again, I think of Negri and the idea that nowadays in, in the so-called uh, post-Fordism, uh, the fixed capital is not something which is outside the, the worker, but is in the worker, because it's about relational, mental, intellectual capacities. But I think the problem is that Zeman declined this very pioneeristic, this very pioneering uh, lecture of his work as a totally neoliberal path. And it's consequent that, and, and, and it is consequent that in 1996, Zeman declared to Hans Uri Kobris in a famous interview that his way of working was deeply influenced by what he called the spirit of 1968. Zeman tells Hobbes, "Yeah, Hans, you know, it was it was adventurous. It was cool. It was we we and we made this. I made this rapture. It wasn't. And we, we made on on our own. What was it?" It was a do-it-yourself. It was the spirit of 1968. But what is evident, even bearing in mind uh, Boltanski and Cappello, is that he wasn't lying. Uh, but if the spirit of 68 has no body, is not embodied in, 
in social processes, this spirit can simply be summoned for whatever reason. And what is quite clear is that the evolution Zeman imparted to the profession of curator was in total connection with the capitalistic attempt to innovate the mode of production as an answer to the struggles and instances of 1968 movements. So what is the result? Of course, I'm being very schematic, but what, what kind of worker results from this uh, process? A worker, first, whose autonomy is expressed mainly through a flight from the institution and not through the attempt to radically transform it. At the same time, he says, no, I want to go away from the museum because the museum is, a, is an obstacle to my personal freedom of, of, of expression. But at the same time, he never questioned the bigger institution, the bigger institution of the market, which gives meaning to all of these search quest for autonomy. Second, a worker whose autonomy is declined as a deeply individualistic and entrepreneurial matter. Again, let's not banalize this, because he was the, one of the first hyper-connected uh, archival curators. He really was inspiring uh, the future curators and future artists with this idea of hyper-connection, uh, strong global ties, but this idea of hyperconnection has nothing to do with common. Is, and we all know, if we work in the system, we all know hyperconnection works as a, or connection, or our relational networks works as, work as devices to get hegemony in the market. Mm? We, we need to be hyperconnected because we know that nowadays, in such a model, in, in, the, in the present, production is collective, production is cooperative. The point is that sometimes we present the fact that we work cooperatively, that we are interconnected, that we are uh, sort of navigating this global network of information, subjects, events, as something which gives a sort of nomadic uh, romance to the way of life that we practice. I think in reality, if we choose another way of life, we won't get any type of work, any type of labor, any type of position, any type of commission, any type of, of success. And I think this, this idea of, of, uh, of this curate, curator, um, curatorial, sorry, curatorial model was developed at its, at its highest degree, for example, by Ansuri Kobis. So, fourth feature of the worker a la Zeman, because I think this is more than curators, this uh, touches all many many, many cases of cultural labor, is a worker to whom profit sound less interesting than the status uh, acquired through his or her professional career. I think, I don't see any Jeff Koons in this room, I think we are actually really committed to the, to the work that we do, to the labor field. And we are, uh, and we owe, I think, not all, but at least many of us, also suffer from a process of quite hard also self-exploitation, not in order to get rich, but in order to work, in order to build our relational field, in order to be acknowledged, in order that what we do uh, is communicated and has a sort of social impact and social meaningless. So, in a, in a way, it's a, it is a strange anthropologic model. It is an entrepreneur of the self, which at the same time doesn't have profit as its main or his or her main goal. Uh, Zeman, as Carolina von Bismarck states in a recent text, uh, appeared in a catalog of a recent exhibition uh, curated by the Getty Cultural Institute, uh, Getty Research Institute, sorry, uh, she states that Zeman also led the path in showing the importance of self-promotion and evil self-historicizing, as during his whole career he constantly referred to his own exhibitions as progressive steps of a unitarian body of work. But institutional art discourse made the rest. His model became hegemonic thanks to 90 super curators, obris before all, and of course, what gave a further acceleration to Zemanian studies was the acquisition of his archive by the Getty Research Institute in, in Los Angeles. 
But a closer look to art history reveals that this model was far from being the only one back then. Uh, other artistic and curatorial approaches did not play with the spirit of 68. On the contrary, without reproducing a farcical, um, out-of-time avant-gardist model, so without going back to the old idea of artists as guides of society and artists that have to destroy uh, their art in social processes and melt art with life, so without going back to this av classical avant-gardist idea, there are other models and other people that try with spirit and body or with body and soul to participate to the struggle of 1968 and to answer to new cultural needs linked to it. Uh, and I think these are particularly interesting examples because these are not revolutionary artists. Uh, this is not about heroes, about egos, about genius of revolution instead of genius of art. Uh, these are examples, models of cultural labor that became radical at the crossroad of the event of 68. So they wouldn't have existed without a revolutionary event of 1968, and a certain political and institutional discourse around a specific issue in Italy in the 70s. I also think that it's very important to situate knowledge that we produce when we speak about commons. So, and this, this particular issue was called decentramento, which translates as decentralization. Decentramento was a keyword for center-left parties in Italy at the end of the 60s and pointed at the necessity of giving more financial autonomy to local governments, to local council, and inspired a series of cultural policies too, particularly relevant in the field of theatre, but, but not only. And the point that I would like to stress now is that this concept of decentralization experienced a curious transfer a transfer from a purely institutional uh, administrative discourse to the aesthetic dimension, with a very, very specific political consequence. It made possible the experimentation of non-neoliberal models of cultural production. This was possible in this case for a short amount of time, during the so-called Long Italian 1968, for, so from 1968 until 1977. This was a season of high social mobilization, of radical social mobilization. And uh, after repression came, and with repression, with com hundreds of comrades uh, put into jails, with killings of some people, uh, also art could go back to his more traditional way of working. Um, so, first of all, I would just uh, go with a small digression from the, from the art field. I would like to talk about Giuliano Scabia, a novelist and innovative theatre writer, and the work he did in the context of the 1969 action of the decentralization of the Teatro Stabile in Turin. Uh, Teatro Stabile was and still is a public theatre based in Turin, and in 19, so the, this action, this decentralization action, were simply aimed at bringing more cultural products to the peripheries of big city. And this happened because peripheries were made finally visible by worker struggles that before were totally untouched by any social service. It was only thanks to the 50s and 60s worker struggles that the peripheries, industrial peripheries of of uh, northern big cities of Italy became visible as spaces that needed social welfare and also needed culture. So this action of decentralization aimed at kind of bringing some theater to the poor people, to the periphery. But Giuliano Scabia made it more than that. Together with his working group, um, it is something more radical. And imagine, imagine the context. So on July the 3rd, uh, 1969 in Turin, in the workers' neighborhood of Mirafiori Sud, where Giuliano Scabia decided then to work, 
uh, and to build a participated theater action, uh, in this neighbor grown around the main Fiat factory, a huge revolt exploded. It was later known as the revolt of Corso Traiano, the Corso Traiano revolt. So workers, extra-parliamentary groups, and local youth clashed for an entire night with the police to protest against the increase of house rents. And also keep in mind that only three days later, the revolt of Corso Traiano, the resignation of Zeman from being director of the Custale became effective. So we are, we are in the same time, but in so, but in so different temporalities. Um, anyway, the, the revolt of Corso Traiano is now seen historically as the opening act of the so-called Autunno Caldo, the hot autumn the season of highest workers' conflict in the history of Republican Italy. And Scavia, in, in November 1969, became a six-month-long work of field research, assemblies, and meetings in different peripheral neighborhoods, neighborhoods of Turin. So residents, students, workers, union, association, priests, schools, autonomous groups, were involved in a collective process of writing and creation, a process of writing theatrical action. So, and the people, the inhabitants, the workers, the students he got in touch with in that particular neighborhood when the revolt of Corso Traiano took place, Mirafiori Sud, they decided that they would have worked together in the direction of a theater action exactly on that night of struggle. And what is interesting and what really struck me as a sort of source for what now we call social art is that uh, Scabia really maniacally uh, recorded every day the process of participation of assemblies, meetings, researches that he was um, carrying in the direction of these theatrical actions. Of course, that means that the process is as important as the mise en scène. But also, um, and, he, uh, and all these records are fortunately published in this book, Teatro nello spazio degli scontri, which can be translated as theater in the space of confrontations, as theater in the space of struggles. And I just wanted to show you how he recorded, because this is significant, um, this is significant of the idea that he had of, this, of, it, of the work he was, um, uh, he was doing. Um, so, you see here, for example, uh, Teatro dentro le contradizioni, battaglia lacerante e ideologie discordi, uh, theater in the space of confrontation, uh, hard struggle and different ideologies. And then he records, at night we had an assembly at Mirafiori Sud, very long debate, Assi social assistants were there, we discussed about the 3 of July, we discussed, uh, sorry, we discussed if we should focus on the 3 of July, the Battle of Corso Traiano, or immigration, um, or the, people are a bit scared about uh, using the 3 of July as a, as a subject. Uh, there, there are here came to this assembly some people who took part to the battle, all the, all the neighborhood was invested, uh, this is very complex. The, the, the fight was also against parties and extra, extra parliamentary groups and so on and so forth. And um, he basically records everything. But then, every day, every, every, this diary has a date, every day. And every day, um, in addition to the record of his activities, he, he records also the, the facts that uh, interested the social mobilization in the country. So, this is a tension uh, within all the factory of Mirafiori. Uh, the workers threaten about going on strike uh, forever. Uh, the group of manifesto, which was a radical communist group of, of activists, was expelled by the, from the uh, communist Italian party. So, why am I showing a, a book page? I'm showing this book page because, in my opinion, this proved the idea that this proved different things. So, first of all, the Scabia Again, it's not in an avant-gardist. Um, it's not an avant-gardist mood. Move, mood. It does not think of itself of um, as an avant-gardist whose goal is to melt uh, art and life, or even worse, as an artist guiding the rest of society. But also, it's not paternalistic. 
His interest is not that of representing conflict. He does not see himself as a mediator or a facilitator, even if he has to do a lot of mediation between the different social subjects that participate in this process. He, doesn't, he does not want to sedate conflicts. He is not interested in any relational rhetorics of creating a context where all the positions are welcome and where differences are seen under the lens of political correctness. Uh, is more interested in participating to this confrontation as an artist. And his engagement is an attempt to revolutionize the creative process, the product of the very process and the role of our institution in relations to society. This, this I think, is very, very crucial and very important. The idea of recording day by day not only your activity as an artist, but also the facts concerning social mobilizations means that you want to eradicate your activity as an artist, as a curator, as whatever you are, within the temporality of the structure. You are participating to that very, to that very temporality. This is I'm not translating all this. This is a very, very interesting record of the night of the mise en scène, with lots of fights, with with, with participated assemblies, which also brought together a very different position. Then, of course, there is a story of a first. Uh, support from the institution of the theatre to these processes, and then finally the fact that basically the, 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 the theatre retired all the support because this was becoming quite too serious under political, under political terms. So this was just an example, and I, I, I don't have time unfortunately to go more in depth, but I, I hope I, I, I was able to um, to make to make the to make the point. The other example is the case of the another case of an Italian art critic, definitely not a revolutionary character, but uh, someone now very well known in Italy for his studies on uh, very traditional contemporary art and futurism and so on and so forth. So it's the case of the critic, art critic and curator Enrico Crispolti, that from 1973 to 1976. So, in the decentralization process, an occasion for artists and art to evolve and to change the direction of satisfying something, satisfying a new mass demand for culture that was, according to him, one of the most important outcomes of 1968. So, you see the difference with Zeman. So, Zeman said, my spirit of 68 was, of course, like to free my individual expression from the bounds posed by the institution. Uh, Crispolti, which was probably, she's probably less, also less innovative as a curator, wanted to answer to other needs, wanted to answer to what he thought it was an outcome of the mass mobilization of 68. So a new mass demand for culture. And he tried with this he tried in a short amount of time, from 1973 to 1976, through his uh, work as an art critic, through organizers of exhibitions, through uh, uh, working together with local governments, basically, to give birth to new figures that could satisfy these new needs. He advocated for what he called the aesthetic operator, which is something different from the artist. Um, he did it uh, in very different uh, contexts, from peripheries of, of big cities, from little country uh, towns to the very center of the art institution, because he curated in 1976, he curated a whole section of the Venice Biennale titled L'Ambiente Come Sociale, the environment as, as social. Um, we don't have the time to go into details here, but it's important to clarify, this is what I would like to point out, some major differences that, the, that position Chris Polti's proposal on a completely different pl plan compared to the neoliberal anthropology of the independent curator Ala Zeman. So, how the aesthetic operator suggested by Chris Polti is different, anthropologically speaking, uh, compared to the Zemanian model of cultural work. First of all, the aesthetic operator has in the social dimension his, her first reference not in the market. He is a character that participates to the epic of labor. Uh, labor here is seen as a counterpart of capital, but, he's a, but this is very important. Uh, he's an epic figure, 
meaning that he wants to participate to a collective adventure, the adventure of labor, seen from a Marxist point of view. Imagine how different was the position of Zeman. Another creature of Zeman was individual mythologies, exactly the opposite. So the idea that mythologies are not rooted in context, but are something that also belong to individuals, which is true, but this is a political choice. I'm not saying individual mythologies do not exist. I'm saying that one is to see yourself as an artist, as a cultural worker, uh, participating to an epic, which could also not be an epic of labor, but an epic of events, of ruptures and constituent, and constituent events, or as you see, if you see yourself as someone that is okay with creating his own individual mythologies in the framework that the market offers. So simply choices. Of course, it's not you have to navigate, you never, I mean, if you probably now you choose to belong all, only to the epic of labor, you would, you would be totally marginalized, you would have no voice in the art field. So, of course, it's about navigating, but just want to be very schematic. Two, uh, the, aesthetic, uh, the aesthetic operator, for this, so for, for this reason, um, he or she, the aesthetic operator, will be more inclined to find, the, to find the critique of the division of labor within collective production than in authorship. This is already discussed. And three, the aesthetic operator does not flee the institution because he or she perceives it as an obstacle to individual expression, but the institution must be transformed, maybe through hard conflict, but must be transformed. You can't just abandon one institution and then being in the same institutional liberal framework or capitalistic framework or reactionary framework. You have to think of creating a communist framework. And why, why, the, 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 why the, uh, the aesthetic operator um, think that the institution must be transformed? Because at stake is not only individual freedom, but at stake there's a different role for our institution in society. This is, again, a completely different, different perspective. In time, so like the request of autonomy from Students Movement in 68, in a way began to contribute to the development of capitalism, this communist, this non-neoliberal hypothesis of models of cultural labor became subaltern to the Zemanian one, which is, again, totally in connection with the spirit of 68, but also totally in connection with the neoliberal teleology, with the neoliberal idea of, of linear time. It's interesting that when Zeman was interviewed by Jeff Corneli, who made a, a, a documentary uh, really during the first month of Documenta 5 in 1972, Jeff Cornelis asked him about Joseph Boyce, you know, the political artist, and he, and, and, he says, and he said something real. He said, well, these are all very radical people, but they will always come to the museum because it's only the museum that can give a sort of social significance to the work they're doing. They don't work without the art institution, which is also true. But again, the attempt of Chris Polti, which was probably very naive and... and and short, because again, it was, 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 was no joke to talk about social aesthetic uh, operators in, in, the, in the 80s with, with, post for, with, with uh, all the postmodern thinking and with all the, the repression, at least in Italy, at least in Europe. Uh, but Crispoldi said something really different. My attempt is that of finding a social practicability for arts. Again, it's total enough. It's totally another word. So uh, I think I, I still have a part about art and institutionality, but I will stop here because it's, it's very late. And the, the, the second part, the one that I'm not referring to, which, by the way, could also be more referred to what, I'm, what we are doing as a collective, as Saladox, um, will be hopefully publishing an article in English quite quite soon, so if you want, I can sort of, when it comes out, give you, give you the link, so thanks for your attention. I was uh, asking myself if your position was uh, closer to that of 
um, extra institutions or because you know when, when you talk about the, this this kind of uh, aesthetic operators, okay, it works it works he or she in a in an institution in a regular run. So that mm, so you're saying that the best way to change things is like a reformism or uh, if we consider counter institutions uh, I think they they don't, they represent a menace for regular institutions. And mm, so you're saying that these ones latter are not effective and the only way is to work inside institutions in a collective way or so you're asking me about the second part that I, yeah. you know, want to. anyway, this is a very, very good question. I think it, it depends on the situation you are in, and there are no, again, gen, at least we at Sadox we didn't find general <coughs> recites for for revolution or radical or radical reform. Um, what are now called alter institutions, I, I divide the field in two. One are governmental alter institutions, which are those who are born within the art system, and they can push the limits of the art system in the democratic sense, but can also work as very effective devices of capture. Um, they come out as exhibitions, as individual artworks, as the work of one individual or a collective working within the art field. Uh, then I, the other thing is what I call autonomous alter institutions, which are those who are born outside the official system. They can be very different, but the, a way to make a sort of stupid taxonomy is to find some common traits. And some common traits for autonomous alter institution could be, for example, that they are born through a collective agency, through the occupation of a space, and their main goal is not to produce more art, but, for example, to free urban spaces for, from uh, neoliberal, uh, from neoliberal uh, enclosures of the city. Then can work through art, can work through uh, the production of law, can work through music, can work through environmental struggle, through whatever. But I think that this, these are, this, is, this is a way to try to map the field. What I think is also that um, <coughs> autonomous alter institutions now are really in a state of sufferance. It would be great if autonomous alter institutions would, I don't know, go together and w would become such a strong network, such a strong subject, would be able to generate such radical events. This is not the case because times are very hard times. So in a way, I also think that there could be assemblages that could be connection between autonomous alter institution and governmental alter institution. The point is to play right. The point is that if you are, if you have a social center, and uh, in the case of Solid Ox, for example, if you have a self-managed activist art space and uh, Museum Reina Sofia in Madrid ask, ask you to work with them on several level, the point is uh, who is advantaging the most from this collaboration? Am I providing, of course, Reina Sofia doesn't, doesn't need my contents, but just to be understood. Or they don't need my specific contents, but it needs, as a, as an, as a progressive art, neoliberal art institution, it needs contents that commoners produce, in a way. So the point is, to whom this collaboration uh, is more convenient, is more, uh, works better, for them or for us? And... Of course, uh, I, I, I'm trying to. What we're trying to do is to uh, use this this collaboration, for example, to uh, highlight the importance of spaces such as Saladox in series of cities all over Europe and to impede the, the eviction of these spaces. So, in a way, I I, I would like to say I'm a, I'm a revolutionary, but I'm, I'm just someone who really tries to think really pragmatically about. Commoning about art commoning and always situating the thing to to work to work on, on on of course there is a global there is a global probe there is a, there are global patterns but also there are very different local local situation this would open another totally different field of of discussion the relationship between uh, 
activists that sometimes are sort of seen as indigenous, as locals, even from very, very, uh, I mean, very well uh, intentioned uh, art people that come and want to work with you as a local. Uh, but sometimes you are the uh, global operator that works in other contexts. So there, there, is, there is a very complex, I think there is a very complex situation. To close it, I think that uh, we should be able to isolate to isolate patterns, we should be able to also to focus on, on problems and then of course to, to do whatever is necessary, could be in a more, sometimes in a more uh, reformistic way, sometimes in a more radical, mo radical protest way to make steps in the idea of common, in the practice of uh, effectuating, of creating different art words. But uh, in uh, sorry, I've been on the um, This is to act tactically, like in the small pavilion, you adapt in, in the environment. But in all this uh, discourse, uh, I see you always say a way of thinking that is uh, strategic in a certain way. But uh, when you talked about in the first part of the speech of uh, this moment, uh, revolutionary moments where there is rupture, but not only in a Gambian way, but also in Navy Spain. Um, we need, I think we need also a strategy behind all yep. this tactic, because today we are not in 68 and there, there are not so many tunnels or there, they are not so evident. Mm -hmm. They move in, they travel on channels that are like internet or other ways. And they, we need these patterns, we need to isolate them, to reuse them, to refunctionalize them. Yeah. But uh, how can we do this uh, not only with, uh, with uh, collective forms like, such as Salem, but mm. in a uh, not independent way, but uh, on my, control, my personal, in my personal part, for example? Mm. What can I do to? Uh, take part in these things and to, in, in practice, what can I do to, to act strategically if, for example, I don't, I'm, I'm not in, I'm not part of a, of a, an institution or other things. I don't know. Honestly, you asked me a too difficult question to answer. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm not that. I'm an I'm 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 old school activist, so I'm always my, my temptation would be that individually speaking, you can't do that much. But I mean, but this is a this is a stupid answer. Uh, this is a stupid answer. I don't know. I mean, I, I, this is this is this is really a, a, a very diff difficult question. I mean, I would have also my idea on strategy. But I think that it's really about it's really about strategy, call it individual or not. But I, I don't think it's it's really uh, it is really necessary. Probably even even on on the level of uh, being let's say let's say having an individual form of life, you can, for example, choose to participate to some events when these events happen, and these events don't don't happen because. Uh, okay, some some organized groups uh, sort of create the conditions. Some organized group can be ready to receive events, but also you, as an individual, can be ready to receive events and to take part of it. Then, on the other end, of course, I think that singularity is such an important, such an strategically is such an important dimension not to be lost in today's form of of, of commoning. Uh, uh, Again, I, I read Negri many, many years ago, but this idea of multitude that now uh, many people criticize because it looks too fragile in front of, of Donald Trump. It looks too fragile in front of uh, Le Front National. It looks too fragile in front of this, all these uh, dickheads that now are governing our planet. But again, the idea of multitude, uh, I think it's really, it's really interesting because strategically, it points out the fact that singularity must not be destroyed by, by the collective action, otherwise it would be uh, a real socialist, and I think uh, at least it's not my cup of tea. Yeah. Okay, we can take one more question. Do you want to 
so much behind the uh, even small time. <laughs> Just a question about the Assad talk uh, and about the European politics, because uh, you know you, we do not perceive you only as local, but I think you are an actor on the scene of uh, you know this global market that is uh, promoted somehow through, through this Biennale system. So you 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 are one of the cultural actors that uh, has to live uh, within this environment. With this, and, uh, and uh, you know, you have your own policy of uh, subverting or uh, co-inhabiting <laughs> somehow. And, uh, you know, uh, you know you, I, I, I hope that you will speak a little bit about this also in the lecture because I think it is somehow in continuity with everything that you have uh, shown. Uh are you interested, interested specifically um, with the Biennale? Yeah, for how, I mean, I'm curious yep. uh, how you manage to be sustainable over years, uh, you know, having a yeah. uh, radical policy yeah. uh, as an institution and at the same time having all the pressure that... Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, first of all, I must say that uh, economic sustainability is possible because so far we, we have been there for almost 11 years now we never were paid for our work we are a collective we are a small collective like 13 15 people uh, which changed during during time and this was the first decision uh, the other was to work through or self-financing that translated into very normal words, it's parties, foreign parties, or through partnerships with, uh, with also local, but also, also with uh, like micro sponsorships uh, programs in which we are 15, every, everyone goes to the 10 bars uh, to where he or she like spending like thousands of money and basically blackmail the owner and say, hey, I spend it. 200,000 euros in, in spritz during the year, give me, 200, give me 250 euros for the next project. It looks, looks funny and looks naive, but it, it, it works. And um, of course, also with uh, more structured relationships. So for example, uh, Sal is also always a, a sort of critical, uh, a, a sort of point of production of critical knowledge on the on the economy of the city and specifically on art economy so at the very beginning we asked we asked ourselves how does gentrification work in the historical city of venice where we are far beyond gentrification we are already into exodus so how does real estate parasite art and we we didn't discover but in, in a way we, we discovered that uh, gentrification and that real estate parasites are through the business of the collateral events of the Biennale. So hundreds of exhibitions that pay rent to private people in all the spaces of Venice. That means that, and, and it was calculated by a local newspaper a few years ago, that every year the, around this issue, this business of renting uh, Biennale pavilions for collateral events uh, run around 25 million of euros per year. And the problem is that I don't know to what to which percentage, but 95 percent of this amount of this money go into private pockets of real estate owners of the city, or go into the pockets of agencies that mediate the the um, the, uh, the renting of these very spaces. So, of course, having such a beautiful space like we are, like we have, we uh, receive tons of. Uh, proposals for renting the space and of course the ethical thing is I occupy the space I don't rent it of course I mean even if for the last seven years we, we have been legal inside we, we were occupied for the first five years then we were able to get an agreement with the city council for seven years we pay a, a, a rent every year we cover our own costs of electricity water whatever we whatever we we use the 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 agreement will expire next year since now there is this little Berlusconi mayor of ours probably next year it's going to be a very delicate time for us probably he will try to evict us exactly like the new major mayor uh, tried or evicted uh, your situation in, in, in Paris 
but so we asked ourselves, how can we go towards sustainability without reproducing this uh, mechanism of renting the renting the the the, the city for art events, which uh, maybe are very interesting events, but at the same time are contributing to the, the, the emptying of the city, are contributing most of the time, because of course one thing would be if all the events were as interesting as this one, as participatory as this one, but 90% are like exhibitions of paintings and sculptures that no one visits during the during the six months of this exhibition. So we said we try to find an alternative model, economic model. We experimented it only once in, in 11 years. So in 2010, if I have still five minutes and I'm closing, uh, the Instituto Ramon Yuyu, which is a, a, a part of the cultural government of Catalonia, the regional government of Catalonia, asked us, hey guys, do you want to rent your space for our Catalonian pavilion? And we say, no, we're not interested in renting the space, we're interested in a partnership. So first of all, we divided the whole space into two parts. The first part was for the exhibition. The second part was free to use for our collective, because you can't just get evicted out of your space for six months because you die. So if you stop your activity for six months, even if it, if it is for collecting money for the rest of the year, you die as a collective. And of course, you give, I think you give the wrong message. So all the money that came into that came to Sale were used to reinvest in a six months program of public seminars. Uh, we were able to invite people from China, from Palestine, from the US. Uh, it, of course, the program was totally public, was totally free, and so on and so forth. Plus, they also asked us, the commissioner also asked us to have two people that work inside the space, and not only museum guards, but they say museum guards, but they were young, cute people that can speak English and then maybe beyond opening and closing the space can do some educational, can help with the, with the general management of the exhibition. And we made a quick research and we saw that those who are not unpaid interest, uh, the average payment for this type of labor in Venice back then, 2010, was 4 euros per hour. And we said, okay guys, we can find, find two guys. These guys has to, have to be paid at least 10 euros per hour, which is really kind of probably even under some, I don't know, under UK minimum wage, I have no idea, but I think so. Uh, and so the, the, this happened. So the idea was to produce this alternative model that in a way uh, uh, is able to reverse the logic of real estate parasiting the brand of the Biennale and parasiting the collective symbolic capital of Venice towards something that is reinvested in a cultural process that is locally curated and uh, at the same time they produce some fair labor. I must say that it wasn't really successful. <laughs> no, I mean for us it was okay, but I never heard that it was replicated by no one in the future. And even for us it was a bit problematic. To, we felt some, even if the people were, were very correct, we felt a bit sort of an alien situation inside the, the space. So we did not, we did not, uh, do it again. Now, for example, we are collaborating, and this helped us a lot also in covering the costs of the rent this year. We are collaborating with the Goethe Institute, for example, but we are doing it because they're not, first of all, they're not proposing like a six months ex exhibition. They're proposing some uh, series of uh, punctual events titled Performing Architecture, and this was a program that we said, wow, we wish we would have curated it because it's so beautiful. So we decided that because of what we perceive as quality of the program. And also because, again, we have a certain voice in the program. We participate to the talks. We are also involved in the production process of the, of the whole thing, of designing the exhibition. So we have an active part in this partnership. We said, okay. Uh, so these are, but again, these are examples. We don't, we, 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 unfortunately, we are very bad with sustainability. We're always struggling and every year we try to sort of navigate and invent ways. Unfortunately, we're not as structured uh, and we're very bad in, in writing uh, European applications, so maybe 
we can exchange <laughs> any email. You can help us because we are very, very bad. Well, I have some bets uh, on bets, uh, sort of like evocative invitation, right? Uh, uh, maybe we should wrap up. And I want to say that I really appreciate, uh, especially in this space, you know, which I described yesterday as sort of like space of becoming as a swamp is this kind of like formless form, right? Uh, to experience this very distinct, uh, very inspiring uh, models, I would call it, forms, you know, that deal with uh, uh, architectural methods, uh, uh, forms that uh, convene uh, uh, communities uh, and collectives uh, for the participatory design, as we experienced uh, listening to, to Doyle and Atelier Architecture of Gere, also forms of listening. Uh, forms of uh, listening that uh, again uh, speaks uh, uh, to the environment that uh, also perhaps has uh, kind of like mutually and reciprocally formative uh, effect on both um, and uh, and also forms of political theatre. Right? So thank you so much Marco thank and uh, thank you all guys uh, and I'm hoping that these forms uh, will be also inspirational to you and it will be taken to Milano, it will be taken to Vilnius, it will be taken to Konas, uh, to MIT, uh, and to Antwerp, and to uh, Reykjavik, uh, and to many other places that, uh, where you all come from, and many languages and cultures that you represent. So, thank you. Thank you.